Today's broadcast is brought to you by viewers like you. Become a member today and unlock exclusive content at patreon.com slash northstarradio. Meanwhile, out in China, the People's Republic is dropping the ball, dude. The whole point of like the co- the communism, socialism is that at least the roads have don't have potholes in it. It's like yes, we don't have any freedoms, but at least right. the damn roads work. Well, some experts believe that is no accident. In fact, they suspect that China is exploiting the hateful content to hurt the United States. Chinese interference and in so many forms, not just the balloons and quite frankly buoys that they found in the Arctic, but also a more insidious kind of Chinese surveillance and that would involve interference into elections or even spying that is going on in this country. China owns TikTok. I mean, that's not, that's that's for sure. So if they want to sow discord in American society, they can easily do that. We're concerned about, um, you know, scenarios in the future where China could take a mil- could take military action to take Taiwan. You're talking about when we get invaded from China, you don't want women raising up arms. How do we feel about Taiwan, Hassan? China or not Taiwan? China? Uh, one country, two systems, you know? No, it's not. It's two different countries. Really? Turning now to tensions with China, recent comments made by Taiwan's defense minister seem to imply that American troops are currently training members of the Taiwanese military on its outlying islands. That would be on the front lines of the conflict with China. I don't think it's even realistic to say I want to live in like a a perfect communistic society because that never that just doesn't work. There's it's antithetical to human nature. The road to socialism is the road to ruin for America. I think that capitalism is a more realistic system of governance than like communism is, you know. I mean, it never works because people are inherently corrupt. Ed, are you a socialist? I'd say so, sure. Dude, we're about You're- to get executed after this. <laughs> If you had to make a list of the top 10 most influential YouTubers still making content today, chances are Ethan Klein would be on that list. He blew up on the platform making incredibly over-the-top reaction commentary videos, poking fun at some of the weirdest people on YouTube. If you were to describe his politics in that era, it would be something along the lines of anti-social justice warrior, where he'd often make videos in response to the popularization of wokeness. He soon moved into podcasting, eventually teaming up with Trisha Paytas. Trisha would often challenge Ethan's controversial opinions, and over time Ethan became more and more progressive. After his falling out with Trisha Paytas, ending the incredibly popular show Frenemies, Ethan teamed up with a new co-host, one with a lot more political prowess, Hassan Piker. This was seemingly the end of Ethan Klein's political journey, co-hosting a show with a political commentator and outspoken socialist. But as time went on, Ethan's true colors began to show, and his skepticism towards the concept of socialism was evident. He'd oftentimes argue with Hassan when certain topics were brought up, especially when it came to China and Israel. This all became too much for Ethan, when his political takes resulted in constructive criticism from his own audience, leading to the ultimate end of leftovers and his interest in discussing politics altogether. What happened? Ethan Klein began his time on YouTube as H3H3 Productions, where he and his wife, Hila, would make incredibly weird videos for Hila's art school assignments. These videos were silly, strange, and at times, disgusting. But they soon started picking up traction, and H3H3 Productions began to change. Ethan started taking H3H3 Productions a bit more seriously, making commentary videos where he'd react to incredibly strange content. But this was around 2016 so reacting to political content was inevitable. While Ethan certainly wasn't one to make political content, he would often find himself taking a bit of an anti-social justice warrior stance when reacting to certain videos. Feel free to take Kanye West though. You guys can have him. You know what you did, Kanye. In a video talking about how racist white people are, you've suggested excommunicating one of your own kind for meeting with the president-elect. That is that is the most backwards, most up thing ever all you guys all you white people you can keep kanye because he met with the president and now we don't want him anymore he certainly wasn't right wing as he'd often make videos criticizing creators for making racist and insensitive content you faked a very racist 
social experiment three in a row. It started with the uh, Salad Lives, the Black Lives Matter, the baiting trunk prank, and then finally the, the Trump car one. So my first question to you is, is frankly this, Joey. Do you hate black people? He was, for whatever reason, looked up to by a lot of boys in the alt-right, anti-social justice warrior space. In the early days of the podcast, he used the N-word a couple times. Certainly not directed at someone, but he said it nonetheless. And he also associated himself with several controversial figures, like when he had Jordan Peterson on the podcast and agreed with many of his takes. A couple of other people were scheduled to do a panel on the suppression of free speech on university campuses, which was canceled by the university, which is really pretty, yeah, it's you great. know, like, it's exactly what you'd expect in today's time where everything is upside down. I don't even understand this concept that seems to be most, I mean, almost entirely prevalent on the, like, extreme left side, where they protest conservative, or not even conservative, people they disagree with, and they shut it down yep. to the point where, you know, like, what happened to you? You can't even give the speech. And to me, that just seems like you're amplifying their message. He eventually acknowledged the problematic audience he cultivated and tried to take steps to change as a creator. But he was definitely still seen as controversial. I mean, he literally on one of my photos said she went from beauty queen to a monster. In 2019, Ethan made a pretty insensitive video talking about women editing bikini photos, which sparked outrage from one of the women he made fun of. That woman was Trisha Paytas, a controversial figure in her own right. But after coming on the H3 podcast a couple times, it soon sparked an interesting friendship between the two. How do you rate me? On a scale of one to ten, then as revenge, as I'd be like, serious. You already said the worst. So. No, well, I think you're the worst human. Yeah, but uh, on a, a scale of attraction, ten. <laughs> no, you don't. A thousand percent. You're 100 percent my type. I can't say it in front of. You. I know you're my type, but I can't say. Ugh. <laughs> Eventually, culminating in the hit podcast Frenemies. Here we are. They said it would never happen. Me and Trisha making a podcast, and uh, frankly. I thought they were right. Trisha Paytas, from her very first appearance on the podcast, was one to push back on a lot of Ethan's takes, as this relationship began with her pushing back on his Instagram verse reality video. Throughout the two years of creating frenemies together, as Ethan began to understand Trisha more and more, he became a lot more progressive and outspoken about progressive issues, like LGBTQ rights and gender expression. We support everyone at Stonewall, we support the gays, West Hollywood. I don't really get it, right? The cause is like, yay, we're gay, or like, it's okay to be gay. I'm not really sure, but I like I like celebrating <laughs> being gay. Well, because gay being gay has been like a major social issue, right? I get that, but who's the revolutionary behind starting Gay Pride Month? Like, who are we celebrating? Who are the pioneers? The gay, the gay people. Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. <laughs> Probably, just, yeah, right? He's included. Ethan even spoke pretty fondly of socialism at the time, citing Scandinavia as an example of where it works. And while Scandinavia isn't necessarily socialist, still running on a global capitalist system, he's absolutely right that social programs like free housing and healthcare make for an all-around better society. Socialism never works. And it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Nor uh, Scandinavia is like a uh, utopia. Frenemies eventually came to an abrupt but much needed ending, but Ethan Klein continued his streak of progressivism, as his new co-host for a brand new strictly political show was a beloved political commentator and outspoken socialist, Hassan Piker. Ethan Klein and Hassan Piker teamed up to create the political show leftovers where Ethan and Hassan would discuss the stupidity of American politics. This was a huge deal for me, as I grew up on the H3 podcast. And after his appearance on the H3 podcast, I was soon obsessed with Hassan Piker as well. Welcome everybody! To the leftovers! The wait is over! That's right. With me, Welcoming to the H3 family and our $3 million set. We spared no expense, Hassan Piker. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for having me. Hassan Piker would play the wise socialist mentor role to Ethan's well-meaning but not so educated liberal position. However, Ethan didn't really see it this way, and as topics were brought up that both Ethan and Hassan disagreed on, Ethan would push back quite hard, as if he knew just as much, if not more, about politics than Hassan. How do we feel about Taiwan, Hassan? China or not Taiwan? China? Or is it China or not China? That's the American policy. Whatever the American policy opinion? is, whatever the American perspective your is. Opinion. You really won't say? No, I, I'm, I'm saying it. it's like one, it's one, uh, one country, two systems, you know? No, it's not. It's two different countries. Really? What's your opinion? Taiwan independent? My opinion on Taiwan is that Taiwan is uh, the, the, the Chinese concept of Taiwan 
should remain uh, in the hands of the people in Taiwan who so therefore believe, it's independent. Who, for the for the record, for the most part, just believe to not disrupt the ongoing uh, the ongoing relations uh, with. Why are you China. being so carefully footed around? This? Because I know that there's going to be a subreddit. Issue. There's going to be a subreddit post with like a million fucking comments being like, Hassan wants everyone in Taiwan to be killed because he loves China. He's a Xi Jinping. That's student. what I heard. At the end of the day, if the Taiwanese <laughs> citizens uh, would ever put this up for a vote, and we're like, we want to fucking be an independent nation, it's up to them. You know what Haven't I mean? They you can't. Done that? Uh, no. Taiwan is already independent. That's what I'm saying. People don't want a formal declaration just because they don't want a fucking war. But they, I'm, they're not wanting to be Hong Kong and get be re like consumed by the Chinese party. They don't want to be Hong Kong. What's what? What happened in Hong Kong? Am I saying the right place? No, you, you're, you they are. They were independent, and then they got eaten. They up. were not independent. Oh, they were, they were had some rights. They were less independent than yeah, Taiwan, and then was, they got eaten. Hong Kong up. was bought by, uh, by you know. Are you saying the people of Hong Kong did not want to be? There were certainly people that did not want to be a part of uh, China. Absolutely, um, that is one hundred percent correct. Most of them. This all culminated on September twenty first, twenty twenty three, when Ethan and Hassan participated in the incredibly torturous socialism versus capitalism debate. That will create, in my opinion, a very scary future for Western liberal democracies where how do you implement that kind of central planning, which already exists, but how do you make it worse? Fascism. Okay. And that's, well, that's what I'm uh, genuinely afraid of. Well, I mean, Barbarism. China's not that far off from it at, in its current state. What do you mean? With like, I mean, they have basically a, a all-powerful leader. Everything's owned by the government. The only difference is they're not at war. They're, so they're pretty close to fascism right now. I would they're say. they're building their military uh, government but rules what culture, done, but what they've done business. with that military is very different than what uh, the American military. Is okay, like. whatever. I mean, they they, don't have, they, they have a large military and they're threatening. It's always a hypothetical. It, I'm and just it's the saying, same with, China's not that far from fascism. It's the same with. It's like if right China's there. China's not that far from fascism. America is literally 10x the Nazi Germany fascism, though. I disagree. You have to admit. China's closer because they have what? the they have you the said one they built a military, but they haven't even. That's the only thing it. I said, they have a government control of business, manufacturing, okay. of social life, of the press. Okay? okay. They have one strong These are leader. authoritarian. Uh, yes, these are authoritarian constructs for sure. And then but fascism the only thing has missing a, from that is basically a, they have they have a national they have strong nationalism. I agree with that. And they yes. have a and the only difference basically now to go full fascist is if they were uh, invading countries. Fascism is supposed to be a a means of control with a with a oftentimes capitalist uh, understanding of the economy to in, in, and effectively to organize the economy Capital and continue organizing the economy. Capitalism doesn't have a lot to do with fascism, I don't think. Capitalism has everything to do with fascism. I don't think Chinese fascism is better or worse Chinese than American fascism. fascism. Why, why is that funny? <laughs> because I don't think that, I, I do not think that China is fascist. I think that they are Cluster. authoritarian. Close. I don't think China is closer to fascism than America. Someone who was seemingly there Understanding the necessity of socialism in the wake of our current failed capitalist state, being friends with an educated, outspoken socialist for a couple years now, was still advocating and pushing for the continuation of capitalism. It was very disheartening to see. But Ethan didn't stop there. Only a few weeks later, after the attacks of October 7, Ethan Klein doubled down on his incredibly bad takes. But no, you're saying Palestinians are fighting back Hamas. Militant? extremist terrorist organizations on the part of ISIS is just Palestinians fighting back. Okay. Leading to much criticism from a huge chunk of his audience, eventually ending any political discussion whatsoever and ending his show with Hassan. Me and Hassan are still friends and this has nothing to do with Hassan, anything he's done, okay? It's just that I'm deciding for myself to uh, not, not <laughs> do that show anymore. I mean, you know what I mean? I'm grateful that everyone that watched and enjoyed it. It was, it's nice to see that people care, care about it and are, you know, but at the end of the day, I need to look after myself at a certain point, uh, not spend my time doing something that is going to be a net negative for me. To a certain point, it's not, it wasn't, it stopped becoming a show to an extent or at least just, you know, the very end of it. After all this time, Ethan was still stuck in his ways and wasn't quite as open to leftist discussion as he made it seem. I'd like to take this time to teach Ethan Klein just a little bit about socialism, and really just open up his mind to a socialist perspective of the world entirely. 
when it comes to foreign policy and dialectical materialism. As I mentioned earlier, I grew up with Ethan Klein. He was a huge part of my coming of age, watching his videos all the time and listening to his podcast on countless bike rides around Minneapolis, discovering new pieces of the world and myself. And when Hassan Piker was introduced to me on the H3 podcast, my entire worldview shifted after discovering the reality that was hidden from me my entire childhood. So much of the hardship around the world and the struggle in my own life finally all made sense to me, and it became my number one mission to learn more and spread the teachings that gave my life a new meaning. So I feel as though I'm in a unique position to discuss this. So please, sit back, relax, as I go back into the H3 archive and discuss some misconceptions Ethan has with socialism and the global economic system entirely. The People's Republic is dropping the ball, dude. Say what you will about America. <laughs> the whole point of like the, co the communism socialism is that at least the roads have don't have potholes in it. It's like, yes, we don't have any freedoms, but at least right. the damn roads work. This is an incredibly common misconception when it comes to discussions surrounding socialism. Here in America, where the word freedom is tossed around left and right, people like to associate capitalism with freedom and socialism with the absence of freedom. But in reality, this couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually the complete opposite. In an article by Sirak Zoltani for Tribune magazine, they write, freedom under capitalism is the freedom to exploit or be exploited. Real freedom is the absence of all barriers that prevent people from living life to the fullest. Even though it's not true socialism, we can use Scandinavia as an example when compared to the United States. You might think people in the United States have the most freedom, but in Scandinavia, they have things like free healthcare, free education, and free housing. Massive stressors for Americans that often cause them to go bankrupt. People in Scandinavia have the freedom of a life without worrying about paying for their higher education for the rest of their life or dying of a disease because they can't afford the treatment. Americans will go to Cuba to receive treatment that they cannot afford here, or to receive treatment that doesn't even exist here. Cuba has a lung cancer vaccine, something that is not available in the United States. First of all, I think it's like the natural inclination of some people. Like, I don't think it's even realistic to say, I want to live in like a, co a perfect com communistic society because that never, that just doesn't work. Th there's it's antithetical to human nature. Another common misconception with socialism, or in fact a reason as why capitalism should continue, is that it's inherently human nature to compete economically. And while it may be true that competition is inherent in human behavior, living under a system that encourages competition only brings out the worst in humanity. In a Tribune article by John Baptiste Odour, they write, Capitalism creates a form of sociability that is fundamentally antisocial. Rather than allowing our social interactions to be mutually beneficial, it pits humans in competition with one another. What is paradoxical about this state of affairs is that under capitalism, human sociability is weaponized against itself. Rather than being enriched through interactions, people are instead diminished by them. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. We are currently living under that exact system, so it's nearly impossible to imagine the world under anything but capitalism. But when you look at early human civilizations, you see a sort of proto-communism, where people work together to make the overall society better, not just their own living conditions. Ethan is very much a social democrat, someone interested in keeping the current order, but strengthening and increasing the amount of democracy in our society. But when it comes to democratizing the workplace, Ethan isn't so much a fan. I started my career 10 plus years ago, and I was successful by myself with zero employees. Yes. I made a lot of money, I, was, I did well for myself, and then, you know, five years ago into my career, I made the podcast, which obviously you all are watching now. Let's say we go back to five years ago when I hired Dan as a freelance. You started as like a f consultant. Uh, yeah, or a freelancer. Yeah. And obviously you moved to full time and I'll get to that. Yeah. So he, he started as like a freelance consultant. So what would be a fair way of compensating him for that? It would be it would be profit sharing. Here's where this seems more like it's a nice theory but like in application, it makes no sense. Who decides how much value he's brought? How could you possibly decide that? If my show is growing, Dan joins, and let's say, yeah, I, I, now I'm making $15, but the show was organically growing. How, how, can I, how can I attribute all five of that to Dan? I don't see what's so great and humanizing about hiring a janitor for 0.000015% of the company. What do you, I, I don't understand. What, that's but, not what I said, but, but, you, so, you just, but you the, just made that assertion. But, you, but we're saying there's a minimum wage. 
The problem with our current system is that most workers are completely alienated from their own labor. Since they have no stake in the profits, they're much less interested in doing a good job and more interested in doing a good enough job to not get fired. When I made sandwiches at Jimmy John's, I saw about $15 an hour, even though I'd often make and deliver around 20 sandwiches every hour. The quality of my work wasn't important. Because I wasn't seeing money based on sandwiches made, I was seeing money based on my hourly output. If I had a stake in the company and my own income was based on how the company was doing, I'd put a lot more love and care into my labor, making sure that each customer I interact with wants to come back and give us more business in the future, overall making for a better business and overall society. Another incredibly common misconception with socialism, a misconception completely caused by Red Scare propaganda here in America, is that socialist countries always end in disaster. I think that capitalism is a more realistic system of governance than like communism is you know communism never works because people are inherently corrupt and whoever's in charge is gonna they're gonna be greedy they're gonna be corrupt they're gonna fuck everything up it doesn't make sense and it's been a guarantee by the same metric that any socialist country d d devolves into into disaster it's a pretty silly observation to make because they're not completely wrong throughout history socialist countries end in disaster they work for a short while but for whatever reason, they either fall apart or their current state in 2024 isn't somewhere I'd want to live, like North Korea. But this isn't because of inherent internal issues that cause the country to crumble. It's from external pressure and conflict with capitalist countries, mostly America. Any socialist country is an inherent contradiction to America's beliefs of capitalism. And if they continue in their success, they're going to negatively impact America's economic control of the world. Just have a look at Cuba. Since they achieved independence in the 50s, America has held strict embargoes on the country, withholding key resources for survival, like medicine and fuel. People often point to Cuba as an example of why socialism doesn't work citing how they use incredibly old technology and live a very hard life. But this isn't caused by Cuban socialism itself, it's caused by America's actions against Cuba because they challenged the existence of America's global power. In 2020, when Cuba tried to buy ventilators from a Swiss company, America blocked the ship from arriving in Cuba. Their conditions are directly the result of America's intervention. The blockade and embargo against Cuba needs to end. And the vast majority of the world agrees with me, except for the United States and Israel. And for the 30th year in a row, they voted. And typically the vote was just like this year's. Get ready. 185 to 2. 185 countries want the United States to end the embargo against Cuba. Two countries voted in, in favor of the embargo. One, which will come as no great surprise, is the United States, which is imposing the embargo. And the other one is Israel. No matter how progressive or left-leaning Ethan Klein gets, he will forever be stuck in his ways when it comes to China. Ethan hates China. And it's quite evident in the things he says about the country. The whole point of like the co the communism socialism is that at least the roads have don't have potholes in it. It's like, yes, we don't have any freedoms, but at least right. the damn roads work. China owns TikTok. I mean, that's not, that's, that's for sure. So if they want to sow discord in American society, they can easily do that. You're Easter. talking about when we get invaded from China, you don't want women raising up arms. How do we feel about Taiwan, Hassan? China or not Taiwan? China? Uh, one country, two systems, you know? No, it's not. It's two different countries. Really? It's like if right China's there. China's not that far from fascism. America is literally 10x the Nazi Germany fascism, though. I disagree. You have to China's closer. Because they have, the, I don't think Chinese fascism is better or worse Chinese than American fascism. fascism. What? Why is that funny? <laughs> because I don't think that, I, I do not think that China is fascist. I think that they are closer. authoritarian. Close. I don't think China is closer to fascism than America. He might not be happy to hear this, but it is 100% rooted in xenophobia, brought on by the popularization of anti-China propaganda from the American State Department. If you've heard anything bad or weird about China from 2019 to now, uh, congratulations, we officially now know you have been the victim of US State Department propaganda. No, it is not time to bust out the tinfoil hats. This is something that Reuters just this week did a report on. This article is available on the Reuters website. I highly recommend looking into it. And it outlines how starting in 2019, Trump and the CIA 
launched a massive propaganda campaign against China. This was a twofold campaign. Uh, they had one arm of it that was geared towards trying to make Chinese citizens dissatisfied with their own government, and another arm which was supposed to make American citizens distrust the Chinese government as well. I don't know about you, but I can think of all sorts of anti-Chinese propaganda that I have heard come out from 2019 on. So if they want to sow discord in American society, they can easily do that. Ever since about 2008, but really ramping up since 2018, China has been the United States' biggest global competition. And because of this, anti-Chinese sentiment has been ramping up in the United States. This comes out in beliefs that Chinese people are brainwashed by their own government and heavily controlled in the things they do and say. Or in 2020, when COVID was associated with China and Chinese people, causing a wave of hate crimes against anyone who appeared Asian. There's been a wave of increasing assaults on Asian Americans during this pandemic. Asians are being stabbed, hit, spit at, and coughed on. Asian-owned businesses are being targeted and damaged, and the elderly terrified to leave their homes because they could be the next target. America always perpetuates these beliefs when talking about China and Taiwan, making it seem that China is threatening to invade Taiwan and other parts of the world, when in reality, it's quite the opposite. America is using Taiwan, and even Ukraine to a certain degree, to threaten China with military action. And Ethan Klein perpetuates this idea of political conflict between China and Taiwan, arguing that they are two different countries. No, I, I'm, I'm saying it's like one, it's one, uh, one country, two systems, you know? No, it's not. It's two different countries. Really? No. They are building their military. Yeah. And threatening countries like Taiwan. But from the Taiwanese perspective, they are the same country that have two different beliefs. Taiwan claims mainland China and mainland China claims Taiwan. They just have two separate ideas of what they want for the country. The Taiwanese ambassador to the United States said, we want the status quo. We want the way it is. Neither unification, neither independence. The way it is is the way we want to live right now. Ethan has also perpetuated imperialist beliefs especially when it comes to Zionism and a free, independent Jewish state in the Middle East. After the October 7 attacks, Ethan was very quick to demonize Hamas and oversimplify what occurred, causing many of his takes to demonize the entirety of Palestine, as he was very adamant about a two-state solution compared to a one-state solution. I find it incredible that people think that Hamas is going to uh, take over all of Israel and happily coexist with Israelis. One state solution is like kind of the same thing. Ethan thinks that if there was a one state solution, there would be mass atrocities against the Jewish population of Israel. Because if you have a one state solution and the right to return, which I agree with, right? I mean, Israel has the right to return. If there's a state of Palestine, it makes sense. But if you're in one state, all that's going to happen is like everybody is um, <laughs> trying to bring as many people there as possible. And like by the time there, there, frankly, are a lot of Palestinians, right, in, in the area. And once the Palestinians outnumber the Jews, basically, the, the, anything is fair game for the Jews. Anything. Conflating Hamas's actions with all the surrounding Arab countries. He's unable to understand why hostility has been the norm between Israel and their Arab neighbors. It's not because Israel is predominantly Jewish, it's because Israel has been the staging ground for the destabilization of the region and overall American control of it. Palestinians don't hate Israel because they're Jewish. Palestinians hate Israel because of the decades and decades of atrocities they've inflicted on the Palestinians. And that goes with all other Arab countries in the region. This is a key example of where dialectical materialism is needed in the analysis. An oppressed people's actions are entirely based on their economic condition not some cultural belief that is inherent in that country. Imperialism is a tool used by the United States to control parts of the world without people knowing. Israel is a military base for war crimes in the Middle East. But if you associate Israel with Judaism entirely, you associate the revolutionary actions against Israel as anti-Semitic and not some greater attempt at liberty from an oppressed people. I hope this video was helpful, not just for Ethan Klein, but really for anyone who has any skepticism whatsoever about socialism. Red Scare propaganda has been so powerful in this country that even thinking about what socialism would look like is nearly impossible, and I don't blame people for having some hesitancy when thinking about it. Socialism is freedom. Freedom to live a life with minimal stress, and to pursue a life that is meaningful as a human being. Love, cooperation, art, 
self-expression. These inherent qualities of humanity are repressed by capitalism, not encouraged. Thanks for watching North Star Radio. Peace and love and free Palestine. Thank you.